afraid my mic battery had died. Uh, I was hoping it had. That gets my goat. I thought we had retired that. Hi, everybody. This is Big Anklevich. And this is Rich Outfield. And we are on the go. That's right. Mannequin 2 is on the move. We are <laughs> in Nevada, getting very close to our destination of Las Vegas. Yeah, who would say Las Vegas? I don't know. I think it was Elizabeth Shue in Leaving Las Vegas. Really? <laughs> and Leaving Las Vegas. Why would she mispronounce words? She was in Karate Kid. Come on. So we're still on the go. And uh, we're almost there, though, so we probably only have one more on the go that is pre-New Media Expo. We'll probably do some on-the-goes at our post-New Media Expo. We have at least one planned that we're probably not going to be able to get to. Today's uh, is kind of a continuation of the last one, though. It is? Because the last one was about Disney. Oh. And the Disney princesses. Yeah. And their most recent foray into film, which was titled Frozen, but should have been called The Snow Queen. Disney's The Snow Queen. Disney's The Snow Queen, right. Yeah, I think I've mentioned this probably on the show somewhere before, but we have the Seen It, Disney Seen It, and that was the way every question was. It was like, what movie had a fox and a hound in it? And you'd say, The Fox and the Hound, and then you turn the card over and it says, Disney's the fox and the hound. Every single movie had Disney's as a preface to it, which I thought was funny. It's like, isn't this the Disney? Do we really need that on the cards? You really feel the need to brand the movie by putting that on the answer for every single question? Wow. But before Disney was this worldwide freaking own everything kind of a monopoly that it is now, before it owned ESPN, ABC, Marvel, Star Wars, Muppets. Indiana Jones, Muppets, Pixar, etc. And there was actually a guy named Walt Disney. They made a movie called Mary Poppins. Disney's Mary Poppins. Disney's Mary Poppins. And, and yeah, we went and saw just the other day the movie that is called Saving Mr. Banks. Can you tell the folks about Saving Mr. Banks, what it's about? Yes, Saving Mr. Banks was about P.L. Travers coming to Los Angeles, California in 1961 to talk to Di Walt Disney about making Mary Poppins into a film. And I guess it had been a an ongoing process. 20 year process, according to the film. Uh, where he had been trying to get the rights and every year she would turn him down. And in the 60s, suddenly she was no longer financially solvent. No one was buying her books anymore. And her uh, publisher basically tells her, you've got to take this job. Otherwise, you know, you'll lose your house. And so she goes out there and on Disney's dime, she is uh, courted, if you will, by Walt himself, by the, uh, the screenwriter, by the Sherman brothers who are writing the songs and co-screenwriting this adaptation of Mary Poppins. And she's got this contract where she gets final say and she, uh, everything has to be approved by her before she will sign away the rights to this book. And uh, we just get to see just how picky she is and how, you know, set in her ways and everything has to be a certain way and that, how very English she is and how unamused she is by all of the trappings of California and Walt Disney's magic. And at the same time, they keep flashing back to P.L. Travers' childhood in Australia, her very hard childhood with an alcoholic father. I, I mean, I have no idea whether they were supposed to be affluent or not. I mean, they they he, had a house and they... And he worked at the bank. He, did. he was the he manager was bank, of the bank. bank manager, yeah. But he was in a small, uh, you know, town in the outback somewhere, so he probably wasn't, you know, a manager of a big bank. But her father instilled in her all these 
these fantastic ideas about the imagination and about, well, just about escape from the boring drudgeries of life. And, and they kept flashing back to this childhood of hers to show how she got to be the P.L. Travers that we were seeing as an adult, the Emma Thompson portrayed P.L. Travers. And, uh, boy, it was a dour movie. But before I say any more, go, you go ahead. Yeah. Did I sum it up correctly? That was a good sum up, I think. It was, I found it really interesting because we had the two sides of that coin. We had young P.L. Travers and older P.L. Travers. And older P.L. Travers, that was played by Emma Thompson, may have been one of the least likable characters I have ever seen on film. She was the main character of this picture, and yet she was, I, I you know, they, they showed the people that had to deal with her, and they were doing like little doodles where they were showing her, no, 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 being just an, a monstrous biatch to them. And she would do just some of the most awful things. She demands that Walt Disney not use the color red in the film because one of the Sherman brothers who had said, does this, is, does this little tiny minute detail matter? He, he actually had the nerve to stand up to her and he's wearing a red vest that day. So she's decided that red will not be allowed in the color in the, in the film. Just some of the things that she would do were so unbelievably unlikable. But as you said, but, she was the main character of the film. It wasn't telling the story of P.L. Travers on one side and Walt Disney on the other. It was her story. Yeah, completely. Disney was uh, even, I mean, the, the, the Sherman brothers and the screenwriter were as large a character as Walt Disney was. Except for that Walt Disney was Walt Disney, so he was kind of larger than life anyways. Um, but yeah, it was all from her point of view. But the two sides of the coin was her childhood memories. She was nothing like... She was a, a happy child. She was a helpful child. She really enjoyed all the antics that her father... You know, her father, who was basically the same as Walt Disney, except for that Walt Disney was not a drunk. Um, and she loved her father more than anything. You would think that Walt Disney would be someone that she would latch on to more and be like, wow, I really like this guy. He's a lot like my dad was. Boy, I'd love to have him make a movie out of my book or whatever. You know, that's funny. I, I never I even picked up on that once until you mentioned that just now. In telling people about the movie that I saw, it didn't occur to me that her father was so much like Disney. Yeah, I mean, every time they were they were playing, and he would pull out stories, and he'd say, oh yes, uh, yes, this, this old nag of a horse here is not really a horse, this is actually your aunt whatever, and she could turn into a horse by the evil witch, and we have to get her to laugh again to be able to, you know, which is stuff that actually kind of made it. It was Uncle Albert, wasn't it? The one that uh, that laughed. I love to laugh. And Uncle Albert. I don't know. That made it. Oh yes, the... you should preface this by telling how much you know and like Mary Poppins. Oh okay. Because yeah, that, when you and I first talked about this way back in July, I guess it would have been. I asked you, do you like Mary? And you're like, oh yeah, I love Mary Poppins. And I'm like, really? Well, then there's a movie that you might be interested in. Okay. Yeah, I totally love Mary Poppins. Mary Poppins, I liked when I was a kid. I didn't really understand it. I was kind of like Walt Disney was in this movie, you know. He, there's a one part that was in the, um, the trailer for this film. I remember when I saw the trailer where P.L. Travers is, you know, going on being the monstrous thing that she was in this film and he says oh for someone who hates whimsy and fun and and fancy sure is strange that you're the person that sent a flying nanny with a talking umbrella to save the children and she says 
Do you think Mary Poppins came to save the children? Then you don't know anything about the story or something like that. And she walks off. When I was a kid, I was kind of like that. I thought, oh yeah, this is, it was all about the kids and they're going off and they're seeing Dick Van Dyke and they're having fun and all that kind of stuff. But since I've become an adult, I see the, the bit of the movie that she's talking about where, oh, there's so much great stuff about their father. And he says, oh yeah, you kids, you know, you have Mary Poppins and your mother and all these people to look after you. Who does your father have to look after him? He's out there all alone in the world and he's got to just make his way as best as he can. And now that I am Mr. Banks, basically, um, the movie means so much more to me. And when I see, you know, the, when the things happen, when I see him walking down and going to the bank for that meeting where he's going to get fired and suddenly, you know, his life is going to be ruined and he has to bravely face that, that's one of those things that makes me well up. But when I see that every time, even when I saw it in the part, you know, they, they, they got to the end of the, this film and they showed her at the preview, the premiere of the movie, and they showed the part where Mr. Bank walks and you hear the music go, da 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 and it swells really loud as he's heading off to this, basically, you know, lay his head on the stump and, and let the headsman take it off for him. It's kind of the uh, uh, metaphor for what he's doing. It did the same to me even just seeing a tiny flash of that scene where we're seeing P.L. Travers, seeing the final product, still did that much to me because I like that movie that much. It's definitely one of my favorites of the uh, good old days when Walt was still around. And probably, I'm trying to think if there was ever one of those where, the, you know, because Disney made all sorts of films. They made animated films, but they also made lots of live action films and a few half and half films as well. And I think of anything that isn't animated, probably Mary Poppins is my favorite of all the old Disney films. I can't think if there's another one that's like that. Does that is that similar to your feelings for it or No, I don't know Mary Poppins at all. And I think part of it is just that awful stereotype that I rail against of boys won't watch movies with girls in them. I think I I always assumed Mary Poppins was a girl movie like Pollyanna. Oh, well, Mary Poppins and, is a girl. And I, I saw it once uh, in Las Vegas when I was like 10 or 11 at that age where you just think hey, 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 curmudgeonly and I, I'm sure uh -huh. that I saw it as a, you know, a child. You know, I think we watched it at school one time back when they would rent the reels and Oh, wow. um, but yeah, it was not one that was beloved in my household and we never owned it. I have never seen it on DVD or anything like that. And, and <laughs> it's funny because somebody was talking about how they well up every time they hear the Feed the Birds song. And I didn't know what that was referring to. And the, <laughs> the songs in Saving Mr. Banks, two or three of them, I thought, I wonder if that's really in Mary Poppins. <laughs> was the other one the one where they're like, a fidelity fiduciary bank. I assumed that one was because I could vaguely remember like an old man yeah. trying to get their tuppence. Yeah, it was all um, the old men singing the song to them. Uh, since I've become an adult, the only reference to Mary Poppins I ever hear is people bitching about Dick Van Dyke's accent. <laughs> I swear to you, that is all I ever hear. Dick Van Dyke is one of the greats. And... Olivier is one of the greats. And so I think that that has painted me in kind of a more of a, oh, well, Mary Poppins must be one of Walt's lesser creations kind of thing. But because I like films about films and because this looked like it was going to be really compelling and I like Emma Thompson, I like Tom Hanks, I was more than willing to go see it. And I enjoyed the movie. It... it itself except for it was so dour yeah every time i started to enjoy myself we were back in australia <laughs> and the suffering continued and i just i mean i understand that they were trying to show how 
that innocent little girl can become the persnickety, if for want of a vulgar word, character that we saw. Now, granted, I should have related to P.L. Travers more because I'm a creative person and I've seen the soulless douchebags of Hollywood take creative things or take beautiful things and stomp on them and turn them into schlock, turn them into stuff that's all like Aragon. And I, uh, and so I instantly should have, you know, been like hissed and booed at this bugaboo, which is Walt Disney. But you can't. A, they get Tom Hanks to play him. <laughs> and then two, the only negative thing we ever saw Walt do was he was smoking a cigarette in secret. He didn't which, want people to see him smoke. Yeah, granted, is, is such a bad thing in the 21st century. But it's... Uh, but you know, still, he, it was it was noble in that he did it in secret, so nobody even knew that he smoked, so that, you know, he didn't influence others to do it, kind of a thing. He was so relatable in such a, you know, it was, it was one of those things where, uh, you know, he was trying to take her book and share what his children found in her book with all the children, which seemed like a very noble thing and I think it's safe to say that no one would know what Mary Poppins is or that there was a P.L. Travers or a Mary Poppins if it hadn't been for the Walt Disney film. Walt Disney's Mary Poppins is what survives into the 21st century and uh, you know there's there's a, a negative to that we always talk about that when somebody makes a bad a adaptation of a book I've been told, like, for example, that Battlefield Earth is a very good book, but it's forever tainted by a bad movie adaptation because the movie always supplants the book. Right. Margaret Mitchell's Gone with the Wind was a giant book forever and shadowed by the 1939 MGM film. The film will live forever long after the book is forgotten. And I mean, it's no fair. But it's just like, you know, L. Frank Baum's Wizard of Oz, wonderful Wizard of Oz, is nothing compared to the, the movie. Yeah. I thought it was funny, the one part where she shows up at her hotel room in uh, Los Angeles and she walks in and there's just loads and loads of Disney paraphernalia left for her in her hotel room. And she clears it all out and, and pushes it into the closet. But... Uh, at one point, she finds Winnie the Pooh, and she goes, Oh, poor A.A. Milne. <laughs> I just thought that was kind of funny. Someone that would have been in the same situation. The film was uh, apparently pretty factually accurate, because, you know, in the time leading up to the film, uh, I did a lot of research about P.L. Travers and... and you know, what her deal was, because I, I had no idea that there was a difficult adaptation process or any of that stuff. Um, and if there hadn't been, I guess we wouldn't have had a movie. But all of her uh, mannerisms or her ways of, of thinking and, and, and just, they actually recorded, and they show this in the film, and then they play some of it during the end credits, but they recorded all of her conferences, the story yeah, conferences. At her request, so she could make sure nothing was missed. And she was just so sure, yeah, that Walt was going to screw her over. That, you know, he was one of those untrustworthy Hollywood types, which, you know, seems to be par for the course nowadays. And so you hear her just making a stink about, no, no, it's got to be THE 131 Cherry Tree Lane. Or, you know, what oh, was yeah. it? She starts out and she's like, exterior, thir 16, Cherry Tree Lane. Um, let's change this to number 16, That's Cherry was. Tree Lane. That is proper. And they're like, no uh, one will ever see that. And he's like, mm -hmm. I will see it. Okay. <laughs> uh, can I kill myself now? And uh, because I like Emma Thompson, I wasn't able to 100% despise this character. But... Wow, it would be so hard to be to work with her, and you know, just her inability to be impressed by anything, even a sunny day, and 
my absolute favorite moment of the whole film is at the end of the movie and she's come to the premiere on her own dime, invented herself, and she's sitting on the row in front of Walt Disney and finally the movie cracks through her resolve. And she's crying. And she's moved and tears just pour down her face and at one point Walt hears her sniffling and he puts his arm around her to comfort her and he says, are you all right? And she says, I so despise cartoons. It's just that I can't abide cartoons. That's what it was. It was so <laughs> funny because wow, what a monster to this point. Oh, it was. I, I, I really, really enjoyed that. Funny moment. how she uh, when she did that, she she wouldn't <laughs> give him the satisfaction. And we talked about it back in July because I had read up about it, and she considered that to be a, a terrible miscarriage of, of an ad adaptation and she never again allowed anyone to do an adaptation of one of her books and Walt had wanted to do several Mary Poppins films and she never gave the permission again uh, something tells me she cashed the checks but yeah it's, it's one of those things where we consider it a classic we consider it the benchmark of Walt's live action or you know history has of Walt's live action forays and yet you know she was never satisfied with it she never was pleased with it and I think there are probably many stories within the Walt Disney legacy within his whole lifetime that would be fascinating to see made into movies I mean I would love to see a movie called Walt's Folly about the making of Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs where you know just the amount of money that guy borrowed and sunk into this project, you know, that was sure to fail. And, uh, you know, it ended up establishing him as the, you know, filmmaker of his generation. Uh -huh. I, I would love to see a movie about that. And, you know, they say that back at, when the animation studio was first beginning, that he was a cruel taskmaster. And he only cared about deadlines and money and all that stuff. And that would be a very interesting experience as well, to see how he went from that to becoming Uncle Walt, who greeted people every Sunday night on the television, and whose only desire seemed to be to make children happy. Well, I guess when you got enough money, you don't have to worry anymore. It's easier to be that way. I don't know. Yeah, it, it would. I'm like you. I dig on that kind of stuff, especially when it's a film when you say you like films about films, I do too, but especially if it's a film that, you know, is dear to me or is one that I really appreciate. Um, you know, Ed Wood, the biopic that uh, Johnny Depp played Ed Wood in, was interesting, but not nearly as, you know, important to me because who is Ed Wood. I, I was uh, completely did not know anything about Ed Wood until after I saw Ed Wood and then came to know later. <laughs> later tried to watch Plan 9 from Outer Space a couple times but never made it through because I always fell asleep. Well, I had been telling you about those two Alfred Hitchcock movies. One was about the making of Psycho and the other was about the making of The Birds. And those were fascinating, but yes, I'm already a fan of Alfred Hitchcock. I already have read books about him and about the making of those movies, and so I appreciated it all the more. Right. Yeah, it makes a much bigger difference, and that's why I think I appreciated this film all, a, a lot more. But I also, I mean, just anything about Walt Disney, I think, any part of his life, anything that's going on would be interesting to me because of how much... Uh, I appreciate the things that he has done with his life and what has been done since his life by those using his name. What other <laughs> live action films from Disney do you appreciate? Did you like The Absent Minded Professor or That Darn Cat <laughs> or some of those? Any of those? Uh, vaguely, I liked The Absent-Minded Professor. I, again, I, I saw it in school, and that's about it. I, I, I don't think I've Disney ever channel. seen it again. 
we didn't have the Disney Channel growing up, and maybe I would have caught a lot more of those then. But uh, they did my favorite. So many of them as at a one kid point. were Swiss Family Robinson. I really uh, love to this one. day. Uh, I I really loved Darby O'Gill and the Little People, and still do to this day. Partly just because Connery's in it and he sings. Uh-huh. Uh, I was confused. I think I the one that I really liked that was like Darby O'Gill but not that I was I confused the two with was the Gnome Mobile. I don't know if you've ever seen that one. I I'm sure I saw it in school. I don't. But know uh, I liked that one a lot. And then you mentioned Darby O'Gill and the Little People and loaned it to me and I started watching it and I was like, oh, this isn't what I thought it was. And I think my wife thought it the same she was confused in the same way she was like wait where's the part at the end where they're all in the soap and they're trying to catch him and he keeps squirting out and going flying everywhere but <laughs> they did so many of those at one point and I guess it was like the 60s and the 70s like they had all sorts of those you know that darn cat and Freaky Friday and the computer wore tennis shoes and like Kurt Russell the longest was, man in the world oh yeah the, the, the world's greatest athlete and Gus and all sorts of those you know films with yeah, Tim see, Conway have, and Don Knotts I don't have me- uh, happy memories of any of the 70s ones it's all like the, the prior ones to that and it might be because those are films that my parents liked and uh-huh. so they made sure to share them with us Old Yeller is one that I always loved and still love and Treasure Island was really good. I remember oh, seeing I that several like times Island. as a kid. And it's, I just... It's interesting, considering how many they made, how few of them are really considered classics, however. I guess they just plowed through them, and, you know, uh, they they probably didn't think, you know, how you, we were talking, I think, in the last episode about, you know, when they made these princess movies and stuff, they were thinking, okay, we're going to re-release this seven years, and re-release it again seven years after that, and you know, it's just gonna keep coming back, so it needs to be something that's good for the ages. But these live action ones, I guess they probably assumed they wouldn't re-release them again and again, and they didn't expect it to be something for the ages. Well, I think Walt himself probably had a lot to do with that. He probably had a, had a, a line of quality that he wouldn't allow them to go below. And, and maybe I'm wrong, maybe there are Annette Funicello films and stuff like that where, you know, where he thought not his uncle. that's good enough kind of thing. Mm-hmm. But I don't know. And, and I would like to see a big movie about Disney or maybe it'd be better to just read a book about it because There's that's where you get all the depth there. and where you get all the details and, and uh, maybe different sides because surely the people that worked with Walt Disney on a day-to-day basis saw a different Walt Disney than the people that saw him twice a year or once. And uh, the, the people that worked with THE Walt Disney knew a different man than the people that just knew Walt or knew Mr. Disney. When he, when he once he was Mr. a Mr. Disney's his father. That's true. Everyone <laughs> <laughs> just calls me Walt. One thing that you and I talked about back in July, and I don't think it made the episode, but I was so impressed. Now, this was a script, Saving Mr. Banks, that was written independently and then pitched out there and tried to be sold. And it's just fortuitous that Disney chose to buy it because it could have been, you know, Paramount options, this thing, and they make it, but they don't have access to any of the Sherman Brothers songs. Or, you know, maybe somebody options it, but they've got an agenda of let's, you know, show what kind of an asshole Walt Disney really was. Whereas this one, I think, if anything, it erred on the side of of either of caution or of uh, of, of sanctifying this man. Right. But the thing that I, that I, you and I talked about all those months ago that I was so impressed by was that rather than building sets and, and doing it with CG, they took a week and painted up Disneyland to look like it did when it first opened to shoot these Disneyland scenes. And they put all the extras in period clothes and all that and just shut down that part of the park so they could shoot that. And I was just so impressed by that. 
that people would do that when it's so much easier to just say, okay, well, it used to look like this, so we'll just fix that and fix that and all this in post. Yeah, hell, we'll just shoot the whole thing in front of a green screen on a studio. <laughs> That is pretty impressive, especially considering Disneyland is a business already, so if they shut it down, they're probably losing money from that, on top of everything else. And then again, they might have just shown up at 5 o'clock in the morning and said, you know, from 5 to 10, we'll get all of our scenes done, and you know, then the, then the crowds will start to appear, but by then we'll be done. You know, I don't know except for that I liked that they shot it there. And I love Disneyland. I didn't grow up in California. You know what I did? I grew up in California just like you did, and I don't know if the pilgrimage to Disneyland was an annual thing. Well, you guys were poor, so maybe not. Yeah, we went a couple of times. I think once when I was around 7 or 8, and then again when I was like 13 or 14. Okay, well, maybe you don't have the love for Disneyland that I do, but... Until I was three or four years old, we lived in La Mirada, California, which is just right there by Anaheim. And I would see Disneyland on the freeway every single day as we were driving up and just, I don't know, it was some place that it's always represented in childhood innocence to me and, and, and joy and wonder, which is I'm sure what Walt would be thrilled to hear. That, you know, I'm a grown man, I'd still love to go to Disneyland. I just think of it, that it's a place where suddenly the time, the clock gets turned back. Yeah, we talked about, I mean, I went to Disneyland a few years ago since we started the Bad Gets My Goat show. Okay, and that's right, and we talked all about it, and I talked about crying when uh, Mickey Mouse defeated the, the dragon on Fan... to uh, see it, Fantasmic, yeah. And, and also that time you cried when the, uh, the Dark Queen threatened that she was going to cut you in an alleyway. I think there was that. <laughs> but that, the, to go back, not the last time I went to Disneyland, but when I first moved to California and I had made a good friend, the two of us went. And I, 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 did I tell the story of we went on gay day? <laughs> yes? No, you didn't tell me the I story. know I've told you the story. I've just not told the story on the air. But we happened to go on on the, the Disney gay days and uh, anyway we were going through the park and the kids would line up to get autographs of people who are dressed up as their Disney princesses which to me was just eye opening I was like but the kids don't realize that these are just people pretending to this isn't really Ariel <laughs> kind of thing and there was this knockout like model type dressed as Mary Poppins and I was like look at that! Yeah, humba, humba. I don't believe it! And the thought that Mary Poppins was attractive or was ever meant to be attractive didn't even occur to me. It just was like, wow, why, why would you cast her as Mary Poppins? I just, I couldn't get past that. And, that, and so I guess probably for the 21st century, that was my memory of Mary Poppins. Was, <laughs> there was a hot chick dressed as Mary Poppins at Disney. So you don't find Julie Andrews to be attractive? Oh, at in the clips and stuff that they showed, and in the, you know the the clips I've sought out since seeing Mr. Banks, she was yeah, she was beautiful. I I I had no memory of that. I don't particularly remember ever being attracted to Maria in Sound of Music. Yeah, but there was something super hot about. Of yeah, Mary, Mary Poppins. Poppins, I think, is more attractive than Maria is supposed to be, though. I don't know. It might have to be just the short hair. Although Mary Poppins had her hair all up in a bun. Have you ever seen, what was the show called? Thoroughly Modern Millie? <laughs> I have not. That was, uh, that was her too. Julie Andrews as well, I think. She was the lead character of that. Um, Are you sure it wasn't like um, Anne Margaret or Debbie Reynolds or something? I'm pretty sure. <clears throat> okay. But yeah, for Any some reason, I, I when I was a child, I never thought of Mary Poppins as attractive, and I think that's probably because I was a child, and so she was like a mom or a authority figure. It's like you just don't see it for some reason until you get old enough to, you know, maybe you're old enough to be like, whoa, my English teacher is actually really hot. I, you know, it's one of those things. Like, can you imagine when you were a kid thinking your teacher was hot, like? 
was there ever a time I know that there's probably supposed to have been a time in every kid's life that he thought his teacher was hot but all I remember is just tons of unattractive scary old librarian looking you know really old and weathered people as teachers now that I'm older maybe it's just because those people are the same age as me now or something I don't know I see teachers at my kids' school, and I'm like, wow, I got a lot of hotties for teachers here. Hubba hubba. It's one of those things that I guess changes when you... This uh, road is unbelievably bad, by the way. <laughs> when you get older and realize that teachers are just people. They're not some kind of creatures that, you know, are only let out of their cages long enough to torture children during the school day and then put back in. I remember one time we were out driving when I was in high school. We were driving somewhere, and we looked over, and my English teacher was there. And we're like, oh, my gosh, it's Mr. Capavilla. And my friend was so freaked out. I'm like, I can't believe I saw Mr. Capavilla. My other friend's like, what are you, do you think he just hides in the closet all weekend long? He's a person. He's going to be out somewhere. That was probably the only time in my life, though, that I ever ran into one of my teachers outside of school kind of weird well we're almost there we're in Las Vegas now where are we supposed to get off I don't know where are we going uh, are we going to the Rio do you want to well it's not quite five so we can still oh, register okay let's so I guess we're gonna have to finish up this episode because our time has run out who would have thought a long journey would we would run out of time doing it but it has uh, flown by I mean, partly because we're talking about this stuff and each episode takes an hour, right? <laughs> or more. So I guess we'll go ahead and uh, zip this one up and say thank you very much for listening. And we'll be back with more on the way back. Maybe we'll even record some that gets my goats while we're there. We'll see uh, who we can chivy into doing that. No one. All right. Thanks for listening. I'm Big Anklevich. I'm Rashad Field. Ciao, baby. Good night. That Gids My Goat is produced under a Creative Commons 3.0 license for some reason. <coughs> all right. We might have to edit those coughs out. Getting attacked. We'll have to edit out all the racial slurs, too. Oh, yeah.